We want to welcome you to worship this morning, coming from First Presbyterian Church in River Forest, Illinois. And we welcome you with very, very great love. We do everything that we do here for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to help you to grow wherever you may be right now, deeper and deeper in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So thank you for joining us this morning. As our call to worship, I'm going to share a couple verses from the prophet Zephaniah in the third chapter, beginning at the 17th verse. The Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in you with gladness and with his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Let us worship God.
Father, what a privilege to be in your presence this morning and to be able to lift up our voices and to be able to hear your word from your scripture. Thank you for the great, great privilege of knowing you, Father. Thank you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we want to celebrate the love of the Father. As we sing this next song, wherever you are, that you, you might be in your kitchen or in your living room, spend this moment just to celebrate His love for you and I. Let's sing this song together, how we give the Father's love for us. How deep the Father's love Please join with me in prayer. Dear God, we come before you this morning and we thank you for another new day. And we do thank you for your deep, deep love for us that is beyond comprehension. 
And as we stand in awe of your love, we're reminded of all the ways that we do not love you in return. And so we seek your forgiveness and ask that you would fill us with your grace, your love, and your compassion, that we might go out into the world and share your qualities with those around us through the power that we receive through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I would like to invite now the children to pay attention to their screen. I have a few things I have to get ready for our children's time today. In case you forgot, today is Valentine's Day. And so I brought my heart. But I have a question for you. How do you know that someone loves you? Do you know it because maybe they give you some chocolate? It always helps for me, but. Um, or maybe you have a favorite pet and you know your pet loves you because they hug you or they smile at you or if they're in a fish tank, they swim by and look at you. Or maybe you know because they give you a hug or a kiss. But God says that we can know his love for us because of Jesus who died on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven and we could have a clean heart and we could be with God forever and know his love every single day. And so I want you to think about that this year as we celebrate Valentine's Day a little different. We don't have parties at our class at school, but we can have a party with God and remember his great love for us. So I hope you have a Valentine's Day that's very happy and full of the love of God as well as the people in your house. See you next week. Good morning, church family. I hope you all are staying warm and well. In this series, Jesus Really, we are continuing to look at the parables and miracles of Jesus in the Gospels to tell us more about what Jesus said, what he did, and how he did it, so that we can get to know him even more. And this is the purpose of the Gospels. As John wrote in chapter 20, verse 31, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Last week, Paul preached on the parable of the soils and focused on how the word of God is the seed that though it has the appearance of weakness, it has the power to transform your heart and life and release its power as fruit in us. Today's miracle account is a well-known one, the healing of the centurion's servant. In the book of Matthew, it comes just after the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus had taught vast crowds that had gathered to hear him in the northern region near Capernaum, where this account takes place. So if we remember that the word of God, which is what those crowds were hearing for days as they listened to Jesus's teachings, is like a seed taking root within us, let's now turn to our Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 through 13, to this account of the faith of a Roman commander and listen for the signs that the seed had fallen on good soil. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, 
but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what signs did you hear? I imagined that you recognized that the centurion acknowledged Jesus' authority over disease in his request for healing, and then saw the fruit in that the centurion asked Jesus to heal someone else. And you would be right. Let's look at some more signs together. So when I look at this passage, I am struck by how we get from the centurion asking for help in the first verse. And just after four verses, we have Jesus in verse 10 being amazed at his faith. Seriously, the Lord Jesus, creator God, was amazed. The word here can also be translated as marveled at, really giving us a sense of wonderment. It's the same word that is used to describe what the shepherds felt at, the, at Jesus' birth after the angel's revelation to them of who Jesus really was. And it's the same one used to describe what Mary and Joseph felt when they took Jesus to the temple for a blessing and heard the prophet Simeon tell them who their son really was. When people came face to face with the Lord's presence and his words, they marveled. But here it is used of Jesus himself. Its equivalent is not used in the Old Testament as a response of God, just of people. And while in the New Testament it is used many times as a response of people, it is also used twice as a response of Jesus. Once is in Mark 6.6, 6, when Jesus was strongly rejected in his own hometown in Nazareth. It is used to describe his amazement at their lack of, of faith their unbelief. That profound unbelief is what prompted Jesus to leave Nazareth and move to Capernaum, according to Matthew 4.13. But here in Matthew 8, it is an overwhelmingly positive response to profound faith. That is a response from Jesus that I can only dream and hope to receive. What made Jesus respond like this? Let's look much closer at those four key verses to try to understand. And for an even deeper understanding, let's first look at a little bit of background here. Capernaum was a center for commerce, though it wasn't a wealthy town, where fishing and trade were important being right on the Sea of Galilee. And the town was a, Ro a Roman tax polling station. From Matthew 4.13 and 9.1, we know this is where Jesus lived. And from Matthew 17, it was where he paid his taxes to Caesar. From Matthew 9.9, 9, we know that Matthew, a tax collector, lived here and was called to be an apostle from here. Peter, his brother Andrew, as well as James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were all living here when they were called by Jesus in Matthew 4. Much of Jesus' ministry in Galilee happened here in Capernaum, what some callers, scholars call his home base. The Sermon on the Mount likely happened on a mountain or hill somewhere nearby. 
as we see Jesus coming down off the mountain in Matthew 8.1, and a few verses later, he was entering Capernaum. We also learn additional details from Luke's account of this story in Luke 7, 1 through 10. From Luke, we learn that the servant is highly valued by the centurion and was actually ill to the point of death, which, of course, Luke, being a physician, would want to include that kind of a detail. We also learn that the Jewish elders in town testified to Jesus on behalf of the centurion basically declaring that he deserves to have this request honored because he has shown love to the Jewish people there and helped build their synagogue. Scholars point to this account in Luke as evidence that there existed places where the Jews and Gentiles who were non-Jewish were friendly, which isn't the case in most other places in the biblical accounts. A quick note about the differences between Matthew's account and Luke's account. Matthew's account has the centurion approach Jesus himself, whereas Luke's account has the Jewish elders approach Jesus as agents for the centurion. In that time, what a person does through agents is said to be done by the person themselves. Luke tends to give greater details throughout his gospel and found it important to provide the Jewish elders testimony. We also know that Luke was writing primarily to a Gentile audience, so including more details on the Gentile centurion kind of follows. Whereas Matthew simplifies the account while keeping the focus on the centurion's faith, and we know that Matthew wrote to a primarily Jewish audience, so included more details of Jesus's response for them. The centurion is a Roman officer in charge of 100 soldiers. It is believed that these soldiers were there probably because Capernaum was a tax polling station. It is interesting to consider that the authority that the centurion was under, as he mentions to Jesus in verse 9, was Herod, who was in charge of Galilee at that time. This was the Herod Antipas who had just killed John the Baptist and who wanted to kill Jesus, though it was his father, Herod the Great, who had had all the infants killed at the birth of Jesus. That family would have been perfect for the Game of Thrones, I think. Anyway, it is truly remarkable that someone within Herod's own ranks demonstrates belief in Jesus' divinity and authority. Considering that the Romans have their imperial cult of worshiping the emperor as a god, and at that time it was Caesar Augustus, this is no small detail. And together with the mentions of Joanna, the wife of the manager of Herod's household, who was among the core group of disciples, this tells us that there were believers at all levels of society, both Gentile and Jewish. One of the things that I regularly remind my students in youth Bible study on Wednesday evenings is to pay attention to what people are calling Jesus. We can tell a lot about their faith by how they address Jesus. People who call Jesus rabbi or teacher have not yet come to believe in Jesus as the Son of God, the one true King. But those who call him Lord most likely have. So, we look at this account. We see right at the beginning that the centurion approaches Jesus in a submissive manner and calls Jesus Lord in verse 6 and again in verse 8. So this is our first sign of the faith of the centurion. So then he was a believing Gentile. Where would he have learned about Jesus? If he was on friendly terms with the Jews, and help them to build their synagogue, it is very possible that he had already been learning about their faith when Jesus came to live there. It was a small town, so we can easily imagine that he had heard Jesus preaching, maybe even knew the men Jesus called to be disciples while there. The end of Matthew 4 tells us that Jesus had preached and healed so many people throughout Galilee that large crowds had formed, 
which led to Jesus going up the mountainside to address them all in what we now call the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. It is not hard to imagine that this centurion knew of the healings that had happened there and believed that Jesus had the authority to heal. And this is our second sign of the centurion's faith. Jesus replies with a question, shall I come and heal him? Jesus already knows how the centurion will answer, but he gives him the opportunity to speak and to demonstrate this profound faith for the eyewitnesses there, which will in turn allow all of us to read about it. This military commander repeats the title Lord and then proceeds to admit his unworthiness in a show of humility our third sign. The ancient Greek language uses grammar to give additional emphasis in ways that our English does not. Here we see that emphasis is given to the word my, as in, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. This gives us a clear view into the centurion's humble and respectful attitude, that he recognizes the barriers of ritual uncleanliness that would have prevented a Jew from entering his home, even though he was an officer of the occupying government in this town. I am reminded of the account of the tax collector and Pharisee in Luke 18, where the Pharisee exalted himself and his good moral actions, but the tax collector did not and could not even lift his eyes and stayed in the back to pray for mercy. For his sins. Jesus says that that tax collector was justified and would be exalted for his humility and faith. Humility, something Jesus himself demonstrated over and over, is something that the Lord treasures in us and is needed for a deep and transforming faith. The centurion then goes on to say, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. He amazingly believes in Jesus' ability to cure his servant from a distance, merely by a word of command, which is our fourth sign. We have yet to see such a healing take place from a distance. This is the first one. So there is no precedence or expectation for it. Instead, the centurion relies on his own experience with the military, where he gives orders under and with the authority of the emperor and can expect his soldiers instant and complete obedience. So he believes that Jesus, the son under the father's authority, the creator of the universe, gives orders for illnesses to be cured instantaneously and it will be done. The Greek expression used gives the idea that this word is the instrument by which the servant will be healed, just by his word alone. This is a far cry from the many other accounts where people demand signs from Jesus, or they see or hear multiple signs and still don't believe. Let's also not lose sight of the fact that the centurion is asking for healing for someone else, not himself. His request shows that he is looking out for the good of others, which, combined with his kindnesses and respect given to the Jews in his community, demonstrates loving his neighbors as himself. So Jesus marvels at this response by the centurion, which is apparent to everyone there, and Jesus addresses his response to them first. He says, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. We know from other passages that when Jesus starts with truly, we are to pay careful attention. The Greek puts emphasis on the words translated as have not found anyone, which we know to mean that the Jews have not demonstrated profound faith like this and they consider themselves God's people, which Jesus will address in a moment. The word translated as faith is only found eight times in Matthew, 
and it always points to trust in Jesus. In this context, that trust is in his ability and readiness to give help in unexpected ways. These next two verses are only in Matthew's account for the benefit of the Jews, though they are included in another passage in Luke 13 when Jesus teaches about the narrow door. Jesus uses familiar language that is used repeatedly across the Old Testament, from the East and the West. It, that's meant to include people from out of the whole world, even the Gentiles, where they will take their places at the feast with the patriarchs in the kingdom of heaven. Though we are not told of anyone's response to Jesus' words here, I can only imagine both Jews and Gentiles marveled at them. That is, if they truly understood what they meant at the time. But the marveling continues because Jesus is not done. The subjects of the kingdom refer to the Jews, who believe that they are the heirs of the inheritance due to their birthright. Jesus is clearly saying that a lack of faith in Jesus means that they will forfeit their place in the kingdom. Another interesting small detail Jesus gives us about his second coming is to describe the kingdom in terms of inside and outside lightness and darkness, outside in the darkness, away from God's presence and light, will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Another often repeated phrase from the Old Testament to indicate physically expressed grief and intense distress. Such an extreme state comes from as a permanent consequence to rejecting Jesus. There is no getting around that truth here, and likely why Luke chose to include it as part of the passage on Jesus as the narrow door to eternal life. The simple truth of the gospel is that we are all condemned for our sinful natures, even when we are able to display glimpses of goodness because we are all made in God's image. But God the Father sent his Son to pay for our sin, and restore our natures through the Holy Spirit so that we can live forever in his presence once again. But we must believe this message to receive it. Jesus then returns back to the centurion with a straightforward statement that it would be done as the centurion believed it would be. And Matthew adds the confirmation that the servant was indeed healed at that very moment when Jesus said the word. So how can we learn from the centurion about faith that marvels? First of all, we can't muster up faith on our own. Faith is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 23 tells us, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So first, we must pray for faith that marvels, as it is a gift from God given to us by the Holy Spirit who dwells in our hearts when we repent of our sin and confess belief in Jesus as the Son of God. But how do we then use this faith wisely as the centurion did? We must trust in Jesus' lordship. Trust in Jesus in all the places of our lives, not just some. Pray for Jesus to show you where you might be holding back, and then ask for help to surrender in those places. Belief is transformed into faith by acting on that belief. James chapter 2 goes deep into this truth. The centurion acted on his beliefs through his actions that day, and those actions showed profound trust and faith in Jesus as the Son of God. When we have such trust in the Lord's control of our life, and even controls when we die, we have no fear of looking out for the good of others, knowing that our good is always looked out for by the Lord. We can share our wealth our resources, and our time with others 
no matter who they are or what they believe. And while we can be careful and looking out for the good of others in this pandemic, we can trust in his lordship over this virus and all of its consequences. Third, we can believe in his authority to heal by a mere word. Just because Jesus doesn't heal all the time when we ask for reasons that we cannot begin to understand doesn't mean he can't or that he won't ever. In the New Testament, there are two different kinds of healing, physical and spiritual. Spiritual healing is when our sin-sick souls are healed by belief in Jesus as the Son of God. John Calvin, the famous Protestant Reformed theologian who lived long ago, states that it is clear that the centurion had first been healed spiritually before even approaching Jesus for the physical healing of his servant. God doesn't always heal us physically in this life, but chooses to heal us by bringing us into the next one with him sometimes. But certainly that always happens when we are. God's healing is beyond our understanding. This pandemic may be exposing darkness that needs to be brought out into the light for lasting healing to take place. While we trust in his healing, that doesn't mean that we should never take it for granted or certainly not to put it to the test by not being careful or looking out for others. We are told not to do that in scripture several times, including when Jesus himself used this reply to one of the temptations he faced in the desert in Luke 4. We need to trust in the Lord that he knows what he is doing and trust that it is for our eternal good. And if we lack patience, again, it's a fruit. Pray for it. Fourth, we need to cultivate humility. This one is likely to be the hardest for some of us. Biblical humility is grounded in the character of God. It is a voluntary adoption of a posture of submissiveness in spite of possessing the power to not have to submit. It is synonymous with biblical meekness. And boy, Jesus was a perfect example of this. An infinite creator God putting himself into a finite human body and subjecting himself to a life as a human and to the suffering and certainly then to uh, the torture and the crucifixion of a death at human hands. Humility towards God is submitting to him by trusting his control, his decisions, to marvel at his goodness and sovereignty and almighty power. I am at once horrified and amazed at how quickly the Lord allowed the entire world to be brought to its knees by a mere virus. I also marvel at how he has given us the tools and intelligence to learn about this virus so that we can do the simple things to protect ourselves from it and how to make vaccines to ultimately conquer it. And that's just grace, unmerited favor. Biblical humility is the opposite of the pride that says, me first. I know it's best for me. That is the very counter-cultural message of the gospel. Imagine where we'd be if Jesus had had that attitude. Do we really see the Lord for who he really is? Do we see a good and just God, full of light and love? Or do we see a warped image of our broken selves? A puppet God that this world has distorted. Do we see Jesus really as the one who would heal us with a word? And gives us opportunities to in the midst of pandemics? It is not putting ourselves first, before God or before others, 
but looking out for the good of others, not just when it is convenient to do so. If you lack biblical humility, it is not possible to love God or your neighbor as God defines it. That may mean for you to wear a mask and forego socializing until this pandemic is over for the good of others. That may mean to actively consider how you can be a part of the solution to rooting out racism and letting go of our privilege. Imagining equity and harmony and then working towards that. We know that all who believe in the Lordship of Jesus are welcome into the kingdom, regardless of how good they are yet at living at God's way. We may not know if that servant believed, but he was physically healed anyway. And I'd like to believe that that was enough of a sign or a seed planted for that servant to also be healed spiritually later. And finally, be a strong witness in our community. We have no idea how the Lord will use our attitudes and actions to bring more people into the kingdom. We know for sure that it is not by labels, such as Jewish or Christian, but by faith, which is open to all peoples to take their place at the feast. This centurion had a strong witness to his community. He saw Jesus for who he really is. And he clearly was not ashamed to make that known to the whole town, no matter how important his job was. This man had all the makings of a great servant leader for his community. I know I'd respect his leadership. This strong captain of a Roman army was not afraid to acknowledge Jesus' lordship, believed that Jesus could heal with a mere word, work for the good of his neighbors, and humble himself for the sake of his servant. It doesn't even matter how anyone reacted to his witness that day. Jesus marveled at his faith. The Lord is the only one that we should be aiming to please, as the Apostle Paul tells us over and over again in his letters. So, may we earnestly seek this kind of faith, a faith that marvels, and it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Will you all please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Oh God, we thank you for this day of life. We thank you for each day that you give us. We thank you for the snow outside that reminds us um, of the way you have covered over our sin with your love. Um, with your redemption, with your atonement. O Lord Jesus, we do ask this day that you would bestow upon us the faith, like the centurion, that you would give us um, the ability to believe the measure of grace, to believe that you are a God that is that powerful, that you can heal from afar, that you can bless us, that you can speak healing, blessing, provision, hope, and peace, and joy into our lives just with a word. So I pray, God, that we would remember just how powerful you are, that we would remember to be um, faithful in our belief, that we would uh, really know your true character, that we would know not only that you have the power to speak that word, into our lives, but Lord God, that you are the one who loves us more than anyone else. So we we pray on this Valentine's Day that um, we would look to you first, the lover of our souls, and that we would serve this church, serve our families, serve our community, serve our city, serve the underprivileged and the poor with the overflow of that love. We thank you that you are our first and truest Valentine, and that we love because you first loved us. Oh God, hear now the prayers of our hearts for those people whom we are concerned about. We know that you hear our prayers. We we lift up now these names to you of people who are struggling or ill.
Thank you, Lord. We continue to ask that you would be with our church, the elders, the deacons, the staff, the youth, the children, the parents. We continue to ask your blessing on Paul as he recovers from his knee surgery. And we ask that as we head into this week where we begin Lent, that you would um, show us your face, let us hear your voice, remind us of the blessing it is to, um, to, to die to ourselves and to be resurrected in you. We want to give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor, and we invite you to teach us during this Lenten season. Thank you for your love. Thank you for being our Valentine. We pray together because you taught us to, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just a few things as announcements before we get to our final song. That is, if you haven't experienced Bible Geeks yet, you really need to. It happens right after this broadcast, as a matter of fact, um, on Zoom. And if you get the Thursday email, you have that Zoom link. Brian does an amazing job of teaching, and especially this time around, this is a challenging, challenging subject. What does God know? When does God know things? How does God know? So I'd really encourage you to take part in this Bible Geeks pre, uh, in this class. And if you have missed this, the first several, those are also available on our YouTube channel. You know, this is the last Sunday before we begin the season of Lent. And... As we begin the season of Lent, green is going to change to purple. This has been a season of growth for us, and now we're moving to a time um, of prayer and of growing deeper and deeper in our hearts with God. And so this starts this Wednesday night, and also this Wednesday night is the first opportunity that we have since November to open the door of this church and I say door one because that's the only one that's going to be open over here, and to welcome 40 people into the sanctuary for the Ash Wednesday service. Now, the Ash Wednesday service also will be webcast just like this, and so if for whatever reason you are not able or do not want to come to church for that service, you will hear it, you can see it on this website. All of the precautions, all of the COVID-related precautions are in place, and you can check those out again on the website. And we do need you to make your reservation. But this is a great opportunity for us now, as uh, COVID is, seems to be backing off just a little, to welcome you back in and to welcome you uh, in person. Each Sunday then, after this, we will also be having in-person worship here. Again, 40 people limit. Um, you do need to make reservations each week. One reservation doesn't carry, but if you go to the website, you'll see you can go down and reserve in advance. You just need to do it. <laughs> we are so delighted that we can invite you now back into this building. Limited basis for now, but there's a lot of hope for what's going to come. Also, in this particular season, we are doing our study of uh, the book Under Our Skin. And um, as people have encountered this book, they have become more and more interested, more and more excited about what is going on as we study this book, about how this author approaches the topic of race. I would really commend to you, take the time, take the opportunity to read this book. Now, you can do it a number of ways. A lot of our small groups are doing it in small group. We actually also have two groups that have formed specifically for this book. Um, those are on Tuesday noon and Sunday night. Or you can simply read this book on your own and then maybe find somebody from the church to talk with, to ask questions, to sort of bounce off each other on the whole issue 
of race and the biblical mandate against racism. Finally, confirmation is beginning on uh, the, uh, in, in early March. And uh, Allison Lundeen, our associate pastor, and uh, Mr. Lynn Hancock will be presenting the confirmation curriculum this year. If you have somebody in seventh or eighth grade, or if you know of somebody in seventh or eighth grade that hasn't received information about this, let us know. You can contact the office here. You can contact Allison Lundeen. Um, however, just let us know, and we will be glad to help you to make those connections. You know, all these things happen, as I've said so often from this pulpit, because of you. We couldn't do the things that we do. We couldn't have the musicians that we have. We couldn't offer the things that we do over Zoom with the technology that we have. We couldn't webcast things unless we had you. And you have been so, so generous. We deeply appreciate it. I encourage you to keep it up because we have so many challenges ahead. Thank you. Thank you for giving. Thank you for giving from your heart as well as from your resources. All sorts of ways to do that, including, as you order the Under Our Skin, Amazon Smile. Now, we're going to move to our final song. And this is a very special song to me. Um, this uh, was kind of a bridge song from the, the uh, call that I had previously to a national uh, ministry to come to River Forest. And the first Sunday in River Forest, this song was sung. It made me feel right at home. But this isn't about me. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus being our cornerstone.
So as we go out into our communities, whether in person or virtually, may we trust in the Lord for his provision and protection in all the ways that we can see and that in the ways that we can't see in all the ways that he'll give help in unexpected ways. May we believe in his ability to heal with a mere word as we face suffering both at home and in our communities and all over the world. May we humble ourselves before our good and faithful God and look out for the good of others as his representatives to this world, as we are strong witnesses in our communities, even in the midst of a pandemic. Dear Jesus, give us faith that you marvel at. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.